Okay, let's uh, test. Test one, two. How do I sound, Mr. Bice? Hello, hello. You can mute. Okay, I'll mute. Mute, mute, mute. Right here. Hello everyone, we have about um, one more minute before we start, so just please be patient and then we'll uh, go ahead and uh, roll out our plans. Thanks for being patient. to 6 p.m. So we will go ahead and get we miss our students immensely and we are very much looking forward to their returning in September. Um, we thank you for joining us for this live stream presentation of our reopening plans. I'm joined here tonight um, by uh, Mrs. Horak, our building principal, as well as Richard Bice, who is our technology coordinator. My name is Jennifer Gaffney and I'm the superintendent here at Sackett's Harbor Central School District. 
Between the three of us, we will be taking you on a guided tour of the Sackett Harbor Central School District Reopening Information Center. And we will also be monitoring the questions that you pose. And in just a few minutes, I'll tell you how you do that. The agenda for the evening is as follows. After my introduction, I will take you on a tour of the reopening information um, center website. So I'll show you the lay of the land. At the very end of this session, when we are all done tonight, we will make sure we will make this web, um, website live for all of you. So we will we're going to kind of dig a little deeper into the website tonight, but you will have the opportunity to go and explore more on your own. Then Ms. Torek and I will specifically focus on the reopening plans with you and we will we will break each section of our reopening plans down for you. Um, and and I just want to just rep, uh, recognize now the stakeholders um, who really worked hard to put that together with us. Uh, next, after we uh, detail the reopening plans, we will then share the FAQ, the frequently asked questions, uh, which we have created, which contains dozens of questions that we think you may have. We tried to predict as much as possible um, from the hats we wear as educators and the hats we wear as parents, the hats we wear as employees. Um, so we um, developed that. We're not going to go through every single question, but we just wanted you to see the types of questions that we have posed and answered so that with hopes that we are putting them out there before you even ask them yourself. But if you have questions, um, we will leave some time at the end for you to do that. And um, we anticipate that the, the volume of information that we have to share with you tonight is pretty expansive. So um, there may not be a lot of time to uh, verbally address the questions that you pose. So please rest assured that if you, if you present us with a question tonight, and I'm going to tell you how to do that in just one moment, we will get back to you either on air, live during the session, or we will make sure that we add your question and our response to the community frequently asked questions, which I'm, in a moment I'll show you where you can find that right on this information center. So let's talk about how you pose questions to Mrs. Horak and me. Uh, this session is being streamed live through YouTube and you can actually post a question right in the chat box in YouTube. It's very simple. If you prefer to use the link that I previously shared in an email, um, and which is also, it can be found on our website as well as on our Facebook page, feel free to use that submit a question form. Uh, we are monitoring both of those forums and um, actually Mr. Bice is presenting the questions right on a separate screen so we can try to keep up with them as we go along in tonight's program. Um, I just want to, again, I want to you all rest assured that we will answer all of your questions one way or another. Before we, re, um, before we enter the reopening information center, I want to share some housekeeping information with you to begin. Again, I want to recognize our stakeholder group for the work that they have done since April, helping Mrs. Horak and I put together our reopening plans. Um, our reopening team consists, um, includes faculty, staff, administrators, a board member, union representatives, uh, parents, students, our school nurse, and our district's medical director. Um, kind of an interesting um, observation I made after um, after our meetings. As I looked around the room during our um, stakeholder meetings, every adult in that room is a parent, and most of whom are parents of school-aged children. So I want you to to know that we get it. You know, we we put these plans together from the perspective of a parent as well as from an educator and the various other perspectives that were around the table. Um, I would like to also say thank you to the community members and the staff members who took the time to complete the reopening survey, uh, which help, helped our reopening team uh, develop our guiding principles for our reopening plans and provided us with some really useful information about where our what our community feels are the greatest priorities when we reopen. Uh, next, it is very important that you understand that this website is still a work in progress. Um, we continue to work on finalizing our plans and some of them are still in draft form. We have been given 
um, very rigorous deadlines and not so much time to work on them over the summer. Um, so just please be patient. We are working as much as we possibly can be working from morning to late night, trying to put all of this together for our community. Uh, but there are still some areas within this website that are just not completed. And tonight I will make sure I point out for you which sections are pretty much finalized, which sections are still under construction. And when this website goes live, you will act there are some of these tabs at the top you will not have access to until that information is finalized. Uh, it is also important that our school, uh, school community understands that the vast majority of our planning that we're going to share with you tonight was mandated by the Department of Health and the State Education Department, and most of it is not negotiable. We are doing what we need to do to get as many kids in our building as often as possible. Uh, the community survey data revealed that we have folks in our community on both ends of the COVID spectrum, and we know that no matter what we do, we will not make everyone happy, and it is what it is. Some of you are going to support our plans, some of you are not. Regardless, I hope that you all recognize that the health and safety and student achievement have been the uh, core and the foundation from which all of the decisions we have made um, and will be made. It's just, it's very important that you recognize that. Um, now we are actually gonna take, we're gonna go on to our reopening, re Reopening Information Center, where you, it's like a one-stop shop uh, that includes all of the information pertaining to our reopening. All right, please note this is also being recorded. So if you uh, have any uh, friends or colleagues who are not able to join us tonight, uh, you can just, this will be posted to our Facebook page and to our website. So uh, this will be accessible later on. All right, so um, I'm gonna start here with our website. So you'll see here that our slogan for our reopening plans, Patriots Persevere. Mrs. Horak and I are both sporting um, some new t-shirts. Thank you, the Sackets Harbor Booster Club. And this is a quick plug for the Booster Club. They will be selling um, this as spirit wear this year. And it is certainly appropriate. Uh, it's Patriots Persevere. And they're great t-shirts, they're gonna be on sale. I'm sure Mrs. German will share that information with you in the very near future. So Patriots Persevere was actually a hashtag during our spring closure. And we decided to continue with that theme because you know, we had to overcome a lot of challenges in the spring with, with the closure of um, students, parents, faculty, staff, me, <laughs> everyone. And so it required a ton of perseverance. And I think we all did a fabulous job um, it was stepping up and, and rolling with it and doing the best we could have done given the circumstances. And um, you know, as, I, as we continue through the summer and look to the fall, uh, there's no doubt that that perseverance will continue to be needed. So there's my little plug for perseverance. Um, so this page is our homepage. This is the landing page of our website. Um, so if you scroll down, we also have links here to the Sackett's Harbor Central School official website. So www.sackettspatriots.com or .org, you click there, it'll take you right to our school website. The Family Connection page, the page that we, um, that we utilized a great deal this past spring, and it contains all of the curriculum and instruction uh, details related to our um, virtual programming. That will continue to remain a really important part of our of our planning. So we've uh, included two very quick links to both of those pages. I'm not going to spend some time here right now uh, reading to you my letter, but there is an introductory letter here that provides some background. I see it's, it looks a little distorted, Mr. Bryce. I'm not sure why. I think it's just catching up. Okay, it's just catching up. Um, but at the very bottom um, at, of this landing page, you'll see the reopening stakeholder team. And you'll see, as I mentioned before, we had a variety of stakeholders representing, representing different groups on this reopening um, uh, team. Um, so take a look at those names. You can see it was really diverse. Everybody had wonderful feedback to share and we're all contributing voices in our planning. And so again, I cannot thank them enough. Um, we met, we started meeting back in April met in May, June, and July, and even have been touching base in August through uh, the virtual means. There's three important, we have many important people around here, but the three important people related to our reopening. So um, I am the COVID-19 safety coordinator, makes sense. I'm also the health, wellness, and safety coordinator in the district. So of course, I'll take on that title of safety quarter in relation to COVID. Our COVID-19 resource person, Jennifer Rowell, our school nurse, our resident on-site medical expert, 
Um, and uh, obviously she works in close concert with Dr. Uh, Joe Genpanya, who is our medical director. And he has been very intimately involved in every step of our planning and will continue to be. And then our learning plans coordinator, Amy Fiedler Horak. So if anyone has any questions relating to any aspect of the learning plans, whether they're in person, hybridized, or virtual, Mrs. Horak is the go-to person on that. So when you're on the landing page, I would advise just uh, kind of ignoring this bottom section here um, and just guiding yourself from the very top. So at the very top, you'll see that we have guiding principles, reopening plans, virtual learning, and so on. I'm gonna take you right now to the guiding principles. And the guiding principles were the tenants that we utilized to drive the, uh, the decisions that we made uh, throughout this whole planning process. So um, we're going to start with something I've already mentioned here in our conversation today. I'm sorry for the distortion here. We'll get caught up here in a moment. The health, safety, and well-being of the children and adults is paramount. Foundation from which everything we've done um, and, and, and will continue to be the foundation in all that we do. Um, next, our next priority principle was that we needed to develop plans that maximize how many students have the opportunity to return into school as often as possible. As you're going to hear tonight, we had, we, you know, we uh, rolled out this sneak peek. We had this one particular plan in mind uh, based on the circumstances at the time, but because we were creative outside of the box thinkers, we were able to make, uh, we were able to increase the number of students we have coming into the building on a, on a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday basis, and we'll talk to you more about that in a minute. But again, because that remained our priority, um, that's something that we will continue to strive for. Um, next, we need to develop plans for multiple scenarios and contingencies. This reopening is an experiment, quite honestly. We have, we're putting all of the things in place to make it a success, but um, at any time, our governor can, um, put a halt to our reopening. At any time, uh, our local area could face an outbreak and we would that would put a halt to our reopening. So we have to develop, we have to, and we did develop plans that would allow us to move from the virtual, uh, from a hybridized in-person setting to a virtual setting, then even back to a, an in-person setting. So we, we hope that what we've created will allow us to be relatively fluid as much as is as, as, as practicable. Our next principle that we use to guide our plans is that we needed to emphasize equity and access to support the students in our community who are emerging from this, this historic disruption. Um, everything from the services and programs we deliver to the technology that we provide our families to ensure that every one of our students has an equal opportunity to access and benefit from um, the education they receive at Sackets Harbor Central School. Our plans need to recognize that that one size does not fit all. And uh, you know, I made sure that I was a, represent, a representative on the New York State uh, reopening team um, with uh, the State Education Department, and this was my big push that you know, little tiny Sackets Harbor shouldn't necessarily follow the same rules as a large New York City school district. That their plans, that the state plans needed to recognize that that not one size fits all. And I believe that to be true for our families. Um, and because of that, it, you'll, we're going to talk more about it. We, um, as our, re, uh, our reopening stakeholder team, um, uh, the majority of us feel very strongly that our that our families in our district should have the opportunity to make the decision to uh, send their children to school for in-person learning, or if they're not comfortable to keep them at home to participate in our virtual learning program. Um, and what the, and, and again, that's aligned with this principle that one size does not fit all. And we recognize that um, that some of our families are going to struggle with um, are very fearful about sending their children back. Some are ready to get them out there every single day and just they're ready and raring to go. Again, we have that 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 COVID spectrum that's uh, that's reflective of what's happening in, outside of our school community. And it's, um, it's certainly something that a school district has recognized and, and we're really trying to work with all of our, our families as best we can to understand their circumstances and um, accommodate their circumstances. Uh, our plans need to maintain community connectedness. One of the things um, that I love about our district and the reason why I'm on my 14th year here in Sackets is because of the community. And we've been so closely linked with our with our parents and our, our students and our um, 
neighbors and businesses in our community. And what we found in the spring was it was really hard to keep that connectedness in, in when we were all virtual. And so we've, we've recognized that when, when, as we move forward, we are going to employ um, practices that's going to continue to keep us connected better than we, than we did this past spring. Um, from the district level down to the, to the, to the building level, down to uh, each particular, even each classroom. Uh, next, we realize uh, that professional development, they need to, uh, the professional development needs to support um, all that we are now having to deal with. Uh, our teachers, when they were thrust into the virtual learning environment in the spring, it was with little to no professional development, especially at SACIPS. Uh, you know, we didn't have, we don't have, you know, a lot of our teachers learned about Google Classroom, but not on a, not on a, on a basis where that's all that they were, that's, all, that's the way they had to teach entirely. So uh, we are developing a professional development plan that will align with and support the plans as we've created them. Um, this is more for at the district level, and but we need to anticipate that there are a significant uh, amount of COVID-19 related budget and fiscal issues um, that, that are going to impact our bottom line and we need to, we have to do what's best um, for the health and safety of our of our community, um, while still remembering that uh, that the the financial uh, landscape of New York State and of, and of public schools right now is incredibly bleak, so uh, so it's 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 a balance and, it, and it's pretty tough. But again, the health and safety and student achievement is the driving force for decisions. And then finally, our plans need to provide continued support to students and staff to address physical, psychological, social, and emotional needs. Um, the The pandemic has created a lot of uh, a lot of stress um, for students, for parents, for our employees, and it's it's the district's intention to do what we can, all that we can, to support those who are struggling. All right, so next I'm going to take you to just on top. We're going to we're going to come back to the reopening plan. So at the tab at the top, we'll go back there in just a minute. Our virtual learning. This is a section you can see it's under construction. We're in the process of working with our teachers to develop this particular section, um, but there are. There are um, just one session I would like to highlight for you. It's called Differences from the Spring of 2020. And this is really important to recognize if you were a family who who had ju you just heard, wow, the district's going to give us a choice. My child can either learn virtually or go or learn in person. You better understand that there's going to be some significant differences from the spring of 2020 to our virtual learning plan that we have in place right now. So some of those differences, and this is not this is not necessarily inclusive. There may be more, but for now, daily student teacher interaction will be required. Each classroom teacher will ensure that that substantive interaction occurs each day school is in session and there will be increased live sessions with Sackett's Harbor teachers. Uh, daily attendance and or engagement we will be documented daily and required from all students and the documentation will actually be in our student management system called school tools. Um, the classroom and homeroom teachers will oversee each of the of their assigned students uh, remote learning plan in progress. We have um, we have um, uh, identified the platforms that teachers will use: Seesaw for K4, Google Classroom for grades five through twelve, WebEx for their live connections. And then the district will adhere to the normal grading processes under the virtual learning plan. And all of the teachers will describe those grading practices to parents and students a little bit later on um, as we um, as we approach the the start of the school year. So um, the the rigor that will be involved in a virtual learning program is going to be significantly higher than what than what our students um, experienced this past spring. And virtual learning, for the record, it works for some kids, but for the vast majority of students, and at least from my observation and the data shows, uh, learn best when they're in person. So we are asking families to take advantage of the virtual experience if you truly are in a, in a position where you are either you, there's medical, the underlying medical conditions uh, your, that your child has or that you have, or that you are just so honestly fearful of, um, of sending your child back to school. Uh, we ask that you use those as the, the, the basis for your decision making and not just because your child doesn't like to come into the school building. 
And I just wanted to jump in there. Um, Ms. Gaffney um, mentioned several different platforms that we may be um, using Seesaw, Google Classroom, or WebEx. Parents, don't don't fret. We are actually um, we're, we're really um, working on some professional development for you guys as well, um, putting together some videos on how all of these platforms will work, and um, so that you can navigate them and feel confident with that. So um, you know, I I did parent universities in the past for some different things. We're going to have lots of parent universities on uh, our different platforms and items that we'll be using this school year. So well, there's a lot of handholding for for uh, parents and students this year with our virtual program um, from, from the administration and probably from the teachers too at some point. All right, so at the top, virtual learning, I just covered a little bit of that. That will be um, completed probably in about a week or two. Next, testing and contact tracing. Our governor has required that districts uh, prominently display these sections on their website, and I have done that. I actually, they were already part of our reopening plans, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, this morning, I met with uh, the uh, Jefferson County Department of Health, along with all of the, re the other superintendents in Jefferson County. And um, we are um, in the process of finalizing what our collaborative testing and contract, contact tracing protocols are. I'll, I'll detail some of the generalities with you when we go through our reopening plan. And then if you just go just slightly over to the right, the rest of the tabs are listed for you. The frequently asked questions um, contain dozens of questions that we that we think you might have and if you have additional questions we will certainly add them to the faq we have the all district reopening correspondence is next anything that we have sent either via letter or a video uh, production or any type of correspondence relating to reopening is going here that's kind of like the portal where it will that where it will stay the surveys so you've, uh, we, I mentioned this earlier, we, had a, we issued a community survey and we also issued a, um, a staff survey and we used that data and we summarized it. And what I've provided here on this uh, particular site is just a summary of all of that data. So as, if you are interested in taking some time, there's a lot, of, a lot of data there, take a look and you can see the wide array of perspectives and positions relating to our reopening. And then, then you might, then you'll definitely gain an appreciation for how difficult it is to create a reopening plan when there's so many a variety of perspectives. Um, and then finally, um, documents from New York State. So if you are ever wondering why in the world did Sackets Harbor include this in their plan? Well, if you go to the documents from New York State and read the 145 pages um, from the Department of Health or the State Education Department or the other documents, you'll see why. Because as I mentioned earlier, a lot of what we're doing, most of what we're doing are, these are absolutely required elements to reopen and not just the administration wanting to make people's lives interesting and miserable, some would say. So with that, let's go ahead now and spend some time on our reopening plans. I will start. I will then turn it over to Mrs. Horak. Um, it will come back to Mrs. Horak and me to then review the FAQ. So our reopening plans. So if you click on the reopening plans, it takes you to um, little picture here with a bus, and these are all the different topics. Um, sorry, again, it's distorted, but I'm going to go down right to the first section, which is communication, family, and school engagement. And I'll try not to read everything for you. Um, I don't want to wait until this. Yeah, I give it just a second. Catches up. Catch I apologize for this, folks. I'm watching it on here, so. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and I will I will share with you the information. There we go. Okay, at least it's it's clear on mine now. All right, so so this these reopening plans uh, were um, were, re were required by the Department of Health and the State Education Department. We had to submit our plans to both of those entities and the uh, they were very clear in the topics that we needed to uh, report on um, in terms of our plans. So the first topic that I'm going to cover with you today is called is the communication and family and school engagement section. So per per the requirements, we and best practices and what we do typically at Sackets is we develop communication plans. We um, strive to be good communicators here in our district. So we have we we have and will continue to develop communication plans um, that um, step that will stem the possible spread of COVID-19. I've already mentioned a number of times our representative stakeholder group 
Um, and I, I wanted to make sure I identified that here under this section because it's very important that folks understand that we we really uh, collaboratively created these plans. It wasn't administration on a mountain doing it all by ourselves. I don't um, think we could have done it by ourselves. No, <laughs> I don't think we could have done it by ourselves either. It's been, it's been interesting. Um, again, survey results were used. Thank you again. Uh, we created this information center to house all of the important information. So this is like the, like I said, the one-stop shop communication tool related to reopenings. In fact, when I submitted the plans to the Department of Health and the State Education Department, I submitted this website link. That's how they're going to see our plans. And they're going to get more than just our plans. Um, we uh, are holding a uh, reopening town hall community forum uh, tonight, and we're also having another one on August 20th. So please plan on that if you are able to join us on August 20th at 6 p.m. Um, we'll, we will be, uh, it will be a higher level of interaction, less information sharing, more discussion at that meeting. Um, in addition to that, we plan to show you, uh, show our community how to use Parent Portal to submit the screening questionnaires. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Parent Square. Or Parent Square. Did I say Parent Portal again? Jeez, okay. All right. Parent Square. Um, and then we also will sh uh, share with you uh, some information about recognizing signs and symptoms of COVID. And um, there, oh, and actually, we're working on producing a video um, that will simulate a uh, student's bus ride, entry into school, walking down the hallway, what it looks like in the classroom, what it will look like at recess, what it will look like in the lunchroom. So we hope to roll that out on the 20th if we can squeeze it all in and make it all happen in a short time frame. We also are organizing a drive through open house for September 2nd from 5 to 7. Typically, we welcome people into our building and it's a beautiful evening that we all gather in the NPR. We have snacks provided by the PTO and we have um, a, a number of tables set up. The Booster Club is selling their apparel. Teachers are there excited to meet their students. Well, we, this year we're going to change it up a little bit. Teachers are still going to be here. They're still going to be excited to meet their students, um, but there's some other important things that need to happen. And so we're going to be set up um, two sections of the school building and the details will be shared with you in the, few, in the next few weeks. Um, next, um, we will use a, a variety of communication tools to get information to you. Uh, for instance, this website is one example. Uh, we will use uh, School Messenger and Parent Square to provide information. We use our Facebook page very often and we'll certainly use old school snail mail if, uh, if need be. Uh, we will uh, be communicating to the community uh, the proper procedures and protocols for visitors before they arrive on our campus. We're going to do some of that tonight. So visitors are asked to call ahead if their visit is not expected. Um, if you do visit, um, you will need to be buzzed in by the main office and will be required to check in there. And all visitors will be told that a mask is required for an entry and a, a quick health screening will be necessary. Temp and answer three quick questions. And, but ultimately, our goal is to keep visitors to a minimum. We're trying to try to keep people that don't need to be here out of here. We have signage. We'll have signage posted all throughout the building and all of the entranceways, as well as in the hallways and in classrooms. Um, a lot of you folks are probably wondering as parents, if I send my child back to school, what if there's a positive case? How am I going to know about it? Well, you will know about it. Stakeholders will be notified using our existing communication platforms. Um, and we will make sure that we notify you of the details. Um, but our, our first and foremost communication will be with the, uh, the, Ill, uh, the, Ill, the Ill child's family as well as with public health. And then public health will direct us on um, the course of action. And then once we have that information, we will be communicating that to our school community. Obviously, confidentiality is absolutely um, key, and we will not be sharing. And, and please, I'm going to put this right up front. Do not ask for us to tell you if someone uh, who's sick. Um, we cannot share that and will not share that. All right, next uh, important part of communication is the training, the professional development. So we have a variety of training that we are in the process of putting together um, in, on topics such as hand hygiene, um, proper face covering wearing, social distancing, our new procedures in the building, cleaning procedures, recognizing signs of COVID, mental health training, and much more. And training will be provided to students, parents, staff, and our substitute teachers. So we're going to move on to our next topic, which is health and safety, which is, which is uh, quite lengthy. So 
Um, just a general statement here in the beginning, just a reminder that that yes, we are reopening our school district, uh, but we are still in the midst of a pandemic. Um, so we are asking for our entire community to continue to adhere to the same judicious precautions of safety and hygiene for yourself and others, because COVID is still a threat. So I just, I wanna make sure that, that, that just because we're reopening does not mean that, that we believe that COVID is no longer an issue that we have to deal with. It is still an issue. We are still going to take things as seriously as we ever have. Um, uh, I'm the safety coordinator, as I mentioned earlier. Now, let's talk about social distancing and face coverings, because this was a really hot topic in the, on, in the survey that we uh, disseminated and then received your feedback on. When social distancing cannot be maintained, a face covering must be worn. That is a requirement. Um, it's a requirement from the Department of Health and uh, of, this, in the, of the State Education Department. We have purchased, if you can see this, uh, they're cloth face masks. Uh, we've purchased a few for every student and faculty and staff members. I've been wearing mine for the last week or so. They're pretty breathable. Um, they have the Patriot logo on them. If you, uh, as a family, choose a, a different face covering, that's absolutely fine. If you make your own, if you go and buy a fancy one, or, or you've got something that's comfortable, you are absolutely able to do that. Um, and if you um, forget, if your child forgets their mask in the morning or before they get on the bus or uh, before they come into the building, disposable masks will be available for those students who forget. Um, the face coverings must be worn on the bus, in the, if they get up and go to the bathroom, in the hallways, working in small groups, if teachers have them work in small groups. Um, the uh, student may remove their face covering when seated at their desk. So as you probably know, um, all of our desks are, are spaced uh, at least six feet apart in all of our classrooms. Therefore, as long as students are seated at their desks, they can take off their face covering. But any time that a distance of six feet cannot be maintained, the face covering has to go back on. And there are, um, there, I thought I took this one out, but there are, um, all of our students are required, but there may be situations where we have students with, with uh, 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 medical issues that, pre that uh, prevents them from wearing a mask. We would need that documentation from their primary care physician, and that would have to be approved by our school doctor. And there are students with special needs who may not be able to wear a mask, but that will need to be documented through the individualized education process, through the CSE process on their IEP. Uh, we will continue to promote frequent and thorough hand washing. We're going to encourage staff and students to stay home if they're sick and discourage the sharing of things. Um, we're going to, everyone's going to be trained in this recognizing the signs of illness. I mentioned that already. Uh, the barriers, uh, we have barriers set up in strategic locations around the, around the district. And we'll share with you what those barriers look like in our video. But essentially, in our, our serving line, we'll have the, uh, the sneeze guards, the office, um, office spaces will have those spaces. And some of our, in our special education classrooms will as well because of that, the type of educational support that a special education related service provider has to provide students sometimes does not allow for that six feet of distance. Um, windows and doors will be left open and safe and appropriate to do so. We're setting up every um, occupied space in our school building with a uh, cleaning supplies bin. It will include um, cleaning supplies, gloves, um, as well as other items. Um, and every teacher will have one in his or her classroom and we'll have them in um, our kitchen area all over the place. Um, the appropriate PPE for everyone will be available in inventory regularly, including our school nurse who requires a higher level of, of personal protective device, uh, equipment, such as the N95 masks. And she's actually going to be fitted for that here soon at our local BOCES. Uh, we are adhering to all of the guidance from the Centers for Disease Control relating to cleaning and disinfecting practices. Our entire buildings and grounds crew will be trained maybe next week, I think it is. And if, um, and then once, uh, once they're trained, our buildings and ground supervisor will come back and we'll be training the rest of the faculty and staff on cleaning disinfecting practices. Because what we're asking is that, that our team here at Sackett's Harbor, everybody pitches in to help keep our, our building as, as safe and healthy as possible, which means, you know, if, if a teacher or a, a teacher's aide or, 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 
Clerical folks can wipe high touch surfaces down as often as possible. We're reducing the likelihood of the spread of germs. And, and I would say the vast majority of people here in, in our building on our team want to do that and want to do it willingly. The water fountains, we will still have them on, but they will be only used to fill water bottles. They will not, children will not be able to put their mouths up to the fountain. So water bottles, Please send your child into the water bottle. The district purchased additional electrostatic sprayers, which are disinfecting devices that are that we can use very efficiently. Um, they're just wands, and you just you press a button, and you just can go through a whole classroom in a matter of minutes. But that's only done after the cleaning. You can't just do the disinfecting alone. Um, we've also established a supervised isolation room to separate our ill children and staff from otherwise healthy persons. Um, that area is located right on the nurse's office, um, right off the side of the nurse's office. And it is, we're gonna, we're kind of reconfiguring that space, improving the ventilation in that particular area as well. Um, as I mentioned previously, no unauthorized persons will be permitted to visit us. Um, folks are asked to, they're, they're, they're required to call ahead. And as I mentioned previously, they have to wear a mask and they have to be screened. Mrs. Uh, Johannesson will be, uh, she's already, she already has a list, uh, our school nurse, by the way, is Ms. Johannesson. Uh, she's uh, created a list of the students we know about with high risk conditions, but we have a lot of work to do. We have to continue to identify those students and staff who not only have conditions, but who live with a person with a high, that, that is considered high risk. And then appropriate accommodations will be provided on a case by case basis with the approval of our district's medical director and um, the and or the superintendent of schools. Um, he's the health he's he's the health expert. So I'm really going to just uh, deflect a lot of those type of health related questions to Dr. Jen Fania. Uh, but um, it's important. I guess I'll share with you now. Um, when when uh, Mr. Horak and I are done with this session tonight, we're going to do two things. We're going to make this live so you can see it. The second thing we're going to do is we are going to send a survey to all of the families in our district. This is a mandatory survey which needs to be completed by Monday, August 17th. In this survey, it will ask, uh, an, it should take five minutes or less, but it asks a number of very important questions. For instance, it asks, do you, are you going to choose virtual or are you going to choose in person? But it's also going to ask you to tell us um, if you have an, if your child or there's anybody in your household with a high risk condition. The only people that will see that information are, are, the, health, are, the, are the health office folks, Mrs. Rowell and um, Dr. John Fania. Uh, but, it, but that survey is going to be very important for us to track that information so that we can help keep our community safe. And then all of our required safety and security drills will be carried out this school year. Um, you know, that's fire drills, evacuation drills, lockdown drills. Some, you know, we're obviously, some of the drills will look a little bit different this year. The kids will have to be six feet apart as they're leaving the school building and can't all congregate in the same location. So we're gonna have to make some changes there. Lockdowns, we're gonna be talking kids through the lockdown scenario rather than actually having them get up and go into the corner of the room um, huddled together. So we are gonna make some changes in regards to that. Now let's talk about the daily health screenings. This, this is a requirement to reopen our doors. We have to do the daily health screenings of students and staff. Um, and we've purchased, uh, we, pur we purchased or we were, we were gifted some, some devices that um, are going to help us with that. We've purchased infrared thermometers uh, to take student and staff temperatures without requiring contact. We have the handheld devices. We have uh, four mounted devices that were gifted to us that we'll put in our entryways and you just simply stand in front of it, takes your temperature. We purchased um, five of the mounted devices for our school buses so the student simply has to put their wrist under the thermometer um, and that will quickly gauge their temperature. So every student will have their, their temperature taking, taken before they step into this building or before they board a school bus. The uh, a web based application parent square will be used for daily temperature taking um, of our staff and the completion of the health questionnaire for everyone. Um, the district will take, as I mentioned, all student temperatures before they board the bus or before they get in, before they enter our school building. The, our staff, we are allowing them to take their own temperature at home and you submit it via the app. Everyone will be trained. Parents will be trained and staff will be trained on how to do this appropriately. Um, let's see here, what else? 
Um, any student or staff member with a temperature of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or higher must remain at home. If one arrives at school and then discovers that they have a temperature of 100 degrees or higher, the school nurse will be contacted, will conduct an evaluation, take that um, in the isolation room, just keep separate from healthy folks, and then that person will be sent home with guidance provided by our school nurse. So all of our faculty and staff will be required not only to take their temperature daily, but also to complete a health screening questionnaire with um, very likely the three simple questions. Are you currently experiencing symptoms? Have you traveled anywhere out of the state in the past 14 days? And have you had any close contact in the last 14 days with anyone who has tested positive uh, with COVID? Um, the same questionnaire will be due from families on a weekly basis on Mondays. Again, we are going to make this so simple for families. It should take a matter of just moments to do this. And uh, for any family that does not submit their screening, we will be assigning a staff member that will go through the list and pull up the, the uh, lack, for lack of a better word, the delinquent families and then call you directly to get that information every week. So you would, you would be doing us a great favor and help us out immensely if you were to please remember to do that. If your child is in, in person, if you can do that, um, and remember to turn in your weekly health screening, that would be so appreciated. And we'll send reminders, um, text and, and email reminders to you as well. Um, one of the things we're really going to ask folks to become experts in are the symptoms of COVID. And we are gonna provide flyers, we are gonna provide overviews and some trainings to, to our school stakeholders. So we've listed them here on our website. Um, the uh, parents, you know, we are pleading with you to keep your children at home if they have any of the symptoms listed below. New onset cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fatigue, fever of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, chills, muscle, body aches, headaches, congestion, runny nose, sore throat, loss of smell and taste, gastrointestinal symptoms of diarrhea, vomiting, or nausea. So, so um, the, the absolute most important part of our plan is people doing what, what is right, which is if you are sick as a faculty or staff member, you stay home. If your child is sick, you keep them home. Um, I'm, I'm one of those parents, um, and I will admit it, that you know, if I had a child that mm, got up and wasn't feeling well, but I didn't necessarily have a fever, or I had a stomach ache, had a headache, I'd say go and just get, try to get through the day. And I'm sure a lot of parents out there are very similar. Um, that mindset needs to stop. If, if your child is not feeling well, they can stay home. And guess what? We have a virtual program in place so they can still participate in the learning. So that's a good, you know, so there's no necess there's not, um, you know, getting out of school anymore. The testing plan and contact tracing plan. Again, these two pieces are still a work in progress, um, but we will work collaboratively with a local public health office to test symptomatic or exposed individuals that includes timely delivery of results and any ensuing testing of additional individuals. And the decision of whether a test um, may need to be conducted will be determined by the student or staff member's physician the school physician or the local county department of health, not by the superintendent and not by the principal or not by teachers. It needs to be determined by the physician, uh, the primary care physician, the school physician or Jefferson County Public Health. And then in the event that a large scale testing needs to be conducted at the school, then we will be working with public health to identify some entity that will come in and provide that service. The contact tracing plan. Um, I, I can let you read a lot of this on your own. I don't, I'm not going to, I don't really want to spend too much time reading this all to you, but essentially we are not the contact tracers at Sackett's Harbor Central School. Jefferson County has a very rigorous contact tracing plan process in place, and they will be working with the school districts to uh, coordinate that entire process. So you can see the contact tracers will identify contacts through the interview of the person. Uh, they will, um, uh, the positive person uh, will be interviewed, um, and then from there, Jefferson County uh, Public Health will provide the district with information about how we should respond, and then we'll, including uh, which families need to we need to quarantine, or whether we need to quarantine a class, or and actually let me let me let me rephrase something. The school district cannot quarantine. Quarantine can only happen. Uh, with, an, with an order from Jefferson County Public Health. So, so 
we can require students to learn from home, but we can't institute a quarantine. Um, so that's something to that uh, that I, I wish uh, that I learned today. Um, and then the Jefferson County Public Health, they will be the ones that will alert the contacts of their exposure. So it won't be the school district, it won't be Mrs. Rowell calling other students in the class, it will be Jefferson County Public Health if they deem it necessary based on their criteria for exposure. So I, I, this, is, this is one of, the, this is one of the, the bugaboos of our plan that really, um, that, I, that I'll be honest and tell you that this is still a work in progress from, not from the district standpoint, but from public health standpoint. There seems to be some differences in the way a couple of different counties are, are handling this, but um, the information within this plan is reflective of Jefferson County's requirement for Jefferson County schools. Okay, so I'm going to break it down for you. If a faculty member, staff member, or a student exhibit one of the symptoms, they will be denied entry into our school district and they will be dismissed after evaluation of the school nurse in the isolation room. And we will utilize a very simple protocol for symptomatic or positive COVID-19 student or staff graphic that I'm going to show you in just a moment. And that was, de that de was developed in collaboration with our school medical doctor as well as with Jefferson County Public Health and parts of that plan are non-negotiable. Um, parents and caregivers will be required to provide the district with a return to school form to be completed by the health care provider. And you'll see here that I have the word link. Um, it, we don't have that form done yet, but eventually I'm going, we're going to get that form done. Mrs. Rowell is working on that and there will be a link directly to that form. And in addition, our plan is to send you that form as an FYI, here's what it looks like, be prepared um, so that everybody's on the same page and, and we're trying to be as proactive as possible about those procedures. Because I'm going to give you the heads up, it's going to, it's going to be annoying. I, um, as, a, as a mom, it's, it's going to annoy me, but it is what it is. Um, so I'm going to go down to that graphic actually right now and tell you what that looks like. I want to break it down for you. And this is the same process for students and staff. And this particular rollout of these plans is not just for the parents and guardians. It, this rollout is for parents, guardians, uh, faculty, staff, students, and everyone else in the community. Uh, the school protocol for symptomatic or positive COVID-19 school uh, student or employee. So the student or employee is symptomatic, and I've already described to you some of those symptoms. They are isolated, they're sent home immediately. We, uh, our school nurse will inform the student or employee that they must seek medical attention and must have a provider know a negative COVID-19 test before returning. So let's go to the right. They, they go get a test, the student or employee tests positive for COVID-19. So then the local health department contacts the student, the parent, or employee to perform case investigation and contact tracing. We talked about that just a moment ago. And then it, contact tracing begins 48 hours prior to the start of the symptoms or 48 hours prior to the positive test for an asymptomatic person. All persons within six feet or more for 10 minutes or more during that time frame will be quarantined for 14 days, monitored for symptoms and tested. The local health department will notify school and for collaboration for contact tracing. So if we head over to the right, the contacts to positive case are referred to local testing sites and can return to school after a 14 day quarantine period. You go to the left, a positive student or employee will be isolated for a minimum of 10 days from the start of symptoms. Student or employee must be three days without fever, um, without use of any, um, with, uh, any medicines and have progressive improvement in symptoms before returning. So let's let's apply the scenario that there's not there's not necessarily a positive test, but there are some still some symptoms. So in that case, if you go to the, if you look at the the bright green boxes, the student or employee has a note from a medical provider, a negative COVID nineteen test, and a resolution of symptoms. Notice I, I used the word and. Um, there was some there was some discrepancy whether that word should be or or and. And the Jefferson County Public Health today made it very clear that the word is and. So I'll use this scenario. I, we have a student is not feeling well, goes to the nurse with a fever and a cough, two symptoms on the COVID list. Uh, Mrs. Rowell uh, calls the parent, does the evaluation, calls the parent, requires the parent to come in, get the child. They come in and get the child. Mrs. Rowell 
describes the next steps, the process that the family will have to adhere to in order to get that child back into school. We'll give them that uh, a form that is a return to Sackett's Harbor School form. And that child will then be seen by his or her pediatrician. Um, we will need then the, the pediatricians will order a COVID test. And then that child can only return once we have uh, the note from the pediatrician saying that they can return, which I believe will insinuate that their test was also negative, and a resolution of the symptoms. So if they still have a fever, they still have a cough, they still have diarrhea, they still have any of those symptoms listed, they cannot return until the system or until those symptoms are resolved. So there's um, that's and I'm explaining it to you how public health explained it to us. This is not a Sackett's Harbor protocol. This is a countywide protocol. So if you have any questions, you're certainly welcome to bring them to me. I'll do my best to answer them. But um, I would steer you to your local medical provider or public health if there are any things or if there are any intricacies of this particular um, flow chart that you'd like to know more about. So next, uh, we are on our section about facilities. And um, this isn't a long section, so I'll be fairly brief on this. So as you probably can imagine, um, we have, in order to space desks out six feet apart, that's different than a normal classroom. So we um, have, we've had to reconfigure um, to, in order to fit more desks in classrooms. Uh, we've asked our architects for some help. They provided us with some assistance in determining space capacity. And that was really helpful, but we were then able to be uh, creative and use space a little bit differently than our architects did to get a couple of extra desks in there while still maintaining that six feet distance. Um, we have considered and will con will continue to consider um, accessing um, uh, additional indoor spaces that could be used for instruction, um, NPR, our gym, our SAC room, other spaces as well. Um, as you know, as I mentioned, we are making efforts to reduce how many people are in our building, visitor limitations. Um, you know, unfortunately, in our, in one of the things I love about our community is a parent can stop in and say, I'd like to eat lunch with my kid today, and we've always allowed that. Unfortunately, at this point in time, we have to put a halt to that until things improve. Windows and doors will be left open. Ventilation has been reviewed and improved in areas. Um, hand sanitizer dispensers have been placed in each occupied space where there is no sink and soap. But every classroom has a dispenser or a sink and soap. Um, cleaning supplies have been provided. Protocols have been put in place for cleaning and people will be trained accordingly. Um, the distance markers, we are we placed in order, waiting for them to arrive and we'll be placing them in uh, the spaces around the building that uh, people might um, congregate or have to line up. And so we'll make sure we, we put those in those uh, locations. And of course, we follow all other rules relating to facilities. Child nutrition. So that's the food service program, our cafeteria. All students attending in person or remotely or virtually, remotely virtually is the same thing, will have access to school meals. So, for instance, if um, all students on Wednesdays, as you're going to hear about in just a few moments, will be learning virtually. On Wednesdays, pre-K through 12 will be virtual learning. Um, if, if families would like to take advantage of school meals, you can still do that on Wednesdays. Um, if you are a family who opts for virtual learning on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, you still will have access to school meals. And, and uh, Mrs. Granchi, I'm not gonna, uh, she's our food service manager, has created a flyer and um, the, the link is right on this page. I'll let you take a look at that flyer, it provides you details on how you would access school meals in a, the virtual setting. Uh, a couple of changes from this past spring that are really important that you know about. First, meals will be free for, for those families who qualify for free meals. Paid students will still need to pay. Last spring, the, uh, the state government was, was, in, was very generous and everybody was free. We could feed anybody 18 years or younger, no matter if they were enrolled in our school or not. Uh, that no longer applies. Um, it will only be for our enrolled students. Uh, schedules will be created by Mrs. Horak and the teachers to allow for necessary time for high, hand hygiene um, and um, proper procedures when eating. Um, they will, uh, most of our students will eat meals with their assigned cohort in the classroom. We, we are likely going to have our grades kindergarten, first and second, eat in the multi-purpose room because we're a little nervous about them carrying food throughout the building, they're little. Um, but the rest of our students will be eating with their teachers in the classroom to ensure that we are cohorting and keeping those kids in their bubble as best we can. We will 
we will prevent, we were going to ask kids not to share food or beverages and strongly discourage that. Um, students will, will maintain a social distance of six feet or greater when consuming their meals. We have all the regular health and safety guidelines that we normally follow. We follow all the same uh, protocols with our food allergies. We just have to make sure we apply those to the classroom and make sure the classroom teachers, um, in addition to the teacher aides, have a good background on, on what needs to happen with certain kids with allergies. And Mrs. Rao will make sure that she keeps all of the uh, needed people in the loop about that. Um, and then you can take a look at the rest there. And transportation. I've been talking too much and I want to turn it over to Mrs. Horak here soon. <laughs> All right, transportation. This has been an interesting one to figure out over the last few weeks as well. So first and foremost, when it, in regards to transportation, we are strongly encouraging our school community, our parents to drop off or walk your student to school, if at all possible, to reduce density on buses. Why? We can't fit as many kids on the bus. We want to make sure that the space on our bus is used for the families who truly do not have the means to otherwise get to school. So again, we will, if you ask us for transportation, we will make it happen. But we are, we are, we are asking you, if at all possible, to do that. Please do that this year for the greater good for the, the sense of team in our school community. Uh, school bus drivers and students must wear acceptable face covering at all times, getting on the bus, getting off the bus when they're seated. Uh, they should also maintain appropriate social distancing unless they're members of the same household. As I mentioned, they'll be screened before they get on. Um, and if they have a uh, temperature of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, they will not be permitted to board the bus, which means a policy we're putting in place this year is that a parent or caregiver must accompany the child under the age of 12 to the bus. Why is this? Because if the child has to be turned away and sent back in the home, if we don't have a way to verify that there is someone in the home, that is very worrisome. So we need a parent, caregiver, or an older sibling. If an older sibling is with that child, that's fine. Just keep in mind, if you send the older sibling to the bus, if they're well enough to come to school, but one of your children is sick, then they both have to go inside and you'd have to figure out a way to get your older, your older um, sibling to school um, after the fact. So a parent or caregiver, we are, we are requiring that this year, they have to accompany the child under 12 to the bus. Um, students shall be loaded in sequential order. Your first one on, you go to the back. Your last one on, you'll be closer to the front. Um, bus seats and high contact spots will be wiped down and disinfected after each run. Um, and then our buses will be equipped with masks and gloves. They are not permitted to use hand sanitizer on the bus because it is combustible. Windows will be kept open when possible and reasonable. And we have added one run in the morning and the afternoon to reduce density on our school buses. So as, as Mrs. Horak will, will detail for you momentarily, we are running our elementary from eight o'clock to two o'clock and then our secondary from nine o'clock to three o'clock. We did that for two reasons. One, to reduce density on the school buses um, so that we could transport as many of our student population who need it as possible, but also so that when we have to screen students when they're entering in the building, we can. it will be a much more manageable process than having all of our pre-K through 12 coming in at us at the same time. So I just share a graphic, just some information about uh, how we arrived at our decision on transportation. So I'm handing over the baton to Mrs. Horak, who will uh, break down the social emotional planning that we've done so far. So all of these um, categories that we've been going through are parts of our plan that the state is requiring. So we always have um, taken the social emotional well being of our all of our students and staff very seriously. Um, and, you know, it's just as critical right now that we're going to re engage as we re engage students and staff and help rebuild out all of those uh, relationships here at, at schools. So before we can get into any academics, we have to make sure that everybody is emotionally ready to, to do those things. So uh, we're going to be taking, um, you know, some a, a lot of time in the first few days and weeks of school to get to, um, you know, come back together, reconnect with one another, uh, work through um, some different activities using our positivity project program that we used last year and sources of strength for students in grades 9 through 12 as well as taking advantage of our school counselors and our school psychologists and our pivot counselor um, they're all going to be involved 
um, and be trained on knowing the warning signs of when students are having um, difficulty. And you as parents, we're also going to share that information with you so that if you notice that your child is having um, difficulties, you know, like readjusting back to school or, you know, something's going on and things are just not going well, that you can reach out to us and we are going to um, have a screening tool that we um, will use to help identify specific needs and students um, in need of assistance. Uh, we're still working on developing that and that is not something we're going to give to every kid, but it's really going to be when a teacher emails Ms. Gaffney or myself or the counselors and they, you know, say, you know, I'm really concerned about, uh, a, you know, my child or, or a student in their class, then we'll say, okay, I'll turn to our school counseling team and say, you know, you, can you please, um, make, you know, touch base with this student and, um, you know, do the complete the um, screening tool so that they can get what the um, support that they need. So every Wednesday, which is going to be a virtual learning day for all students, and I've, I've already seen a couple of um, questions pop up on the thing. I just want to know when my kids are coming to school and when they're going to be home. We're getting to it. Wednesdays, if you, Wednesdays are when your child will be home, pre-K through 12th grade. That's for everybody. Um, and then I'll get into more of the details of that um, in a minute. But Wednesdays, you can expect your child to be home for the virtual learning plan. We are going to have a uh, strong social emotional focus on Wednesdays. So each classroom teacher or homeroom teacher is going to be checking in with their, their group of students. They're going to be working on those positivity project lessons and sources of strength lessons during that time. They're also going to be talking about their other classes. How are things going? Do you need any help with these things? Um, you know, how can I help you manage these things? So um, we're going to be using those Wednesdays um, as an opportunity to check in virtually with our students um, and um, go through some of the social emotional um, learning that we need to, you know, make sure that we have time for it. It is of utmost importance, importance to all of us. So let's talk about school schedules. I know it's what you've all been waiting for. Um, so if this was a normal year, we would go back to our normal schedule and we'd all be here. And that is the, that's where we really want to be. That's, that's that primary goal is that we're going to get everybody back here at school um, full time as soon as it's safe to do so. But at this time, given all the requirements from the Department of Health and the State Education Department, this is not possible. So we are going to open on September 8th for a hybridized um, in person and virtual learning plan. And that's going to start on Tuesday, September 8th. Now, as Ms. Gaffney just said before, this is a little different now because before we didn't know if you were going to be able to have choice or not. You do have choice. So as we said, parents will have the option to send their child to school for an in-person learning program or to keep them at home to participate in the virtual learning program. There is many differences to the virtual learning program from the spring, as we outlined a little bit before. Um, however, once a family makes a decision, that student will be committed to that learning program for the entire quarter. Um, I, if there's issues with um, things like that, you're going to be reaching out to me um, and I'll help work through things with you. You can be work, working through, you know, working with the teachers. Um, but we are asking that if, if you want to, to try the virtual learning, then you're committed for at least a quarter. Um, and then we'll re- um, we will go back and relook at that uh, at the end of the quarter. So for our hybridized in-person and virtual learning plan schedule, um, I'm going to start and I'm going to talk about our pre-kindergarten students first. So they're not going to start school until September, 20, uh, September 14th, which is a Monday. And they're going to be, the, so we have 18 students in that class. And due to social distancing requirements, we are, on, we are breaking that class into two cohorts of nine. So one cohort of nine will attend on Mondays and Tuesdays, and the other cohort will attend on Thursdays and Fridays for a five hour um, pre-kindergarten day. So that'll be an eight to one day. Pre-kindergarten students will participate in virtual or paper-based activities on all the other days of the week. Um, families are gonna be contacted about the plan for pre-K directly um, from, from myself and CAPC and those um, 
packets of information were mailed out this morning, I believe. So either yesterday or this morning, I'm not sure if I, they might've gone out yesterday. So please check your mail. Um, they're going to be coming and it's gonna, it's gonna let you know when your registration appointment is and you can contact CAPC um, to change that if you have any um, questions or that doesn't work for you. But registration is Friday, August 28th for pre-K. So again, they're only gonna be coming your, your child will either come to school for a five hour session on Monday and Tuesday or Thursday and Friday. Um, the rest of the days will be home with um, paper based or virtual activities for them to engage in. Uh, kindergarten students are also going to wait to start until September 14th. Um, and they're going to attend two days a week to allow for a successful transition to school. So we are having kindergarten registration next week, as um, those of you that have kindergarten students know. And uh, as soon as we get through registration, we're going to break um, that group of kindergarten students, the class of 2033, I th believe. Uh, we're going to break them into two classes. Ms with Mrs. Allen and Mrs. Ashcraft, and then we're going to break them into two cohorts for each class. And again, one of the cohorts will come on Monday, Tuesdays. The other cohort will come on Thursdays, Fridays, just until Columbus Day. After Columbus Day, we're going to bring them back together. Their whole class will be attending at the same time. But we really uh, feel like it's important uh, for our little ones that they have the time in a smaller group to learn the routines and the procedures that are going to be implemented. that are going to be much different than they have been in the years in the past. So. Um, we, you know, that's why we've done that. I know that it may not be perfect for some people. They're like, oh, my kid's going to come to kindergarten and I don't have to worry about childcare. Um, you know, this pandemic has really thrown us off for a little bit of a loop, but we really feel like uh, this is the safest way to introduce our newest patriots, patriots to our family. Uh, again, kindergarten registration is going to be held next week. Those letters and information about the registration process have been sent out. If you have a kindergarten child and you have not reached out and enrolled them yet or signed them up for registration, please do so as soon as possible so we can get them in here. Um, just call um, Mrs. Sherry Rose, our district um, secretary at um, the main number and she will get you all set up. All right, so after much hard work, all students in grades one through five are going to attend school here in person, Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Our kindergarten through um, grade five hours, now this is a little bit different because at first we said it was gonna be kindergarten through sixth grade, so just bear with me here. Uh, kindergarten through sixth grade will be in the building from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. All students in grades six through 12 are also going to attend in person, Monday, Tuesday, Thursdays, and Fridays. Their hours will be from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, Mr. Tasser and I have gotten really creative with our schedule. We've worked really hard. Our number one priority was getting every kid in this building, if we can do so safely and have them socially distanced. Um, they may be in some different rooms and they may be in some different groupings that they're not used to, um, but we've made it happen. So we're working on those schedules right now. Uh, so Wednesdays are gonna be virtual for any student in this district. Students are going to be expected to connect with their classroom and homeroom teacher on that day. They're going to, and teachers, after they've done that connection piece, are going to be engaged in planning, collaboration, and professional development. Our teachers really have uh, two things on their plates now remote and you know, virtual instruction and this in person learning instruction as well. So, this hybridized model, um, I know our teachers are up for the challenge, but it is going to be a challenge and it is going to require some extra time for them to prepare. Uh, the buildings and grounds departments are going to be here deep cleaning and disinfecting all occupied spaces and the transportation department will also take this time on Wednesdays to clean and disinfect all school buses. So if you opt for that virtual learning plan schedule, any student in um, kindergarten through 12th grade will attend and engage each day schools in session. Our Sackets Harbor homeroom teachers will connect with students participating in that virtual learning program each school day. Some teachers may choose to employ synchronous learning while others may opt for asynchronous learning opportunities. So let me, I'm sure you've heard these words over and over again. And for those of us that are in, um, that are in education, we know that synchronous learning is that the teacher is present at the same time as the virtual learners, what we're doing right now. Um, asynchronous learning is when the students do not 
attend class at a set time, but rather access pre-recorded lessons and material at a time of their choosing. Um, so that's a little bit different. We are going to be um, requiring, though, that students are, um, they are going to be met with each day um, with the teachers and they are going to be expected to return assignments and engage in learning on every single school day. So Monday through Friday. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about attendance and chronic absenteeism. We've always promoted, um, you know, if your child's not here at school, they can't learn. And if they're not engaging in the learning opportunities, whether it's in person or virtually, we, they're not going to be getting um, the education that they need. So we are um, strongly, strongly encouraging that you have your child, as long as they're not sick or presenting any symptoms, be engaged in learning, whether it's in person or virtually. We're going to be um, acting, generating and acting on absenteeism data, which means you're going to be getting phone calls from Ms. Gaffney and myself, checking in, seeing what we can do to make sure that you're here so that your child can be successful. We're going to, um, you know, continue to promote um, good attendance and we're going to communicate um, that chronic absenteeism as we are right now is, is a problem that affects our whole community. Uh, all right, technology and connectivity. The first step um, in our whole uh, our whole planning process is that we know we have to have equity and access for all as much as possible and that we have to get technology in the hands of all of our students and families. That being said, we have changed our smart schools um, grant and we are going to be fully one to one Chromebook school um, here in the very new future. We just purchased another 200 Chromebooks, so there will be no more. Um, kids going to each room and getting carts for Chromebooks. They will have a Chromebook assigned to them from the very beginning of the school year. So when we do that drive through open house, you will get the, your child will get a form that already has, that we already know which Chromebook they're going to get. It will be given to you. You will sign, you'll read through everything, sign it. When they bring it back into school that very first day, then they will be given the Chromebook from their homeroom teacher. Um, uh, we've changed some of our things um, on our annual update that's going to require um, you guys to give us information about your internet access at home and technology at home. Uh, and we're um, also going to include, you know, questions about your device and connectivity access. Um, again, we're going to be using that equipment sign out form that we used in the spring for you to be able to sign out a Chromebook for every student in grades K through 12 this year. So we're going to start because as with everything with this pandemic, you know, everyone's now, now everyone's trying to buy Chromebooks or everyone's trying to buy toilet paper, whatever it is, it's created a shortage. So we, we're not sure exactly when those new 200 um, Chromebooks are going to arrive. So we're going to start with our oldest students and work our way down with assigning them. And actually, the one thing I would add is the survey that will be required of families to complete um, that will be sent out this evening uh, will ask about your technology um, capacity in your home and in your child care provider's home so that we get some information. And the only other thing is, in addition to the Chromebooks, if we do have any families in our community that do, that uh, unfortunately don't, they don't have access to uh, high speed Internet. Um, we will work with those families to provide hotspots so that they can continue to meet uh, virtually with their teachers and complete those um, online um, assignments. Okay, so I see a couple of questions before I jump into the teaching and learning plan. But so, um, Morgan, the whole grade is, is being cohorted, basic, basically. So if you are a student, this is a great question. She said, will the whole grade be split up or will we all go? You're all going to be here every day. However, you are going to be, for the most part, with a, a core group of students, which is a cohort, in, in one location. And teachers are going to come to you as feasible. Now, for some classes like some of our lab sciences, um, PE, our studio art, especially this is at the um, high, school high school level, you're going to have to travel for those. And the reason that we've cohorted you is so that the amount of traveling between classes is really going to be minimal. Um, so as Mr. Tasser and I have worked on the schedule and are continue to work on the schedule, we're really mapping out which teachers are going to need to move to different rooms, which teachers can stay in a room for a while and, and things like that. So that's a great question, Morgan. So 
as you move up in the in the high school, it really becomes apparent that a lot of kids are taking certain classes. So they'll they'll just kind of stick together as a group, um, and then we'll have a different cohort that's taking different things. We're always going to have those outliers where there may be a few kids that are um, wanting to take a couple of other things. But I'm going to tell you right now, kids, there's not a lot of downtime in your schedule. We got it packed. Um, really, it's it's a I think it's a great schedule, um, honestly. But there's there's not a lot of downtime. Um, another um, question is, will they be um, permitted to bring Chromebooks home? Yes, absolutely. They're going to have to come home, be coming back and forth um, to, to and from school because we could at any given moment be told you're going remote and or there's a case. So we're going we're to have to take care of those things. All right. So I'm going to jump into our teaching and learning plan. So at the heart of this plan is that it's the, the accessibility for all students and that equity is at the heart of all of our instructional decisions right along with health and safety. Those things are just going hand in hand. We're aligning it with the New York State standards. Um, we're doing some work with our teachers um, here early on in the fall and we talked about this um, last at the end of the school year that we really need to be focusing on, focusing on those power standards, those priority standards. What to do when kids leave this specific class or grade level, what are the things that they need to be successful at the grade level? So we're going to be pairing back some of that curriculum and really focusing in on with um, a laser focus on those priority and power standards. We're going to include scheduled routine times for students to interact and seek feedback and support from their teachers. We're going to include regular and substantive interaction with a pro that's the first time I've said that <laughs> word correctly. That word. <laughs> An appropriately certified teacher regardless of the delivery method. So if you're learning virtually or you're learning here in person in school, you are going to have a certified teacher teaching your um, child regardless of which mode they're getting it. And we're going to ensure the con continuity of learning in all academic and special areas. So again, that in-person normal learning plan is just not um, what something we can do right now. So we are going for the hybridized in-person and virtual learning plan with the option for you to choose between that and the virtual learning plan. Um, again, um, there's a couple other things I want to highlight on the virtual learning plan. We are not going to be just using that participation model that we did in the spring where, you know, if, if you went above and beyond, you got a 100. If you, you know, did everything that was required, but you didn't go above and beyond, you got an 85. Um, you know, that 4321. We are going to be adhering to the normal grading processes under the virtual learning plan. And each teacher is going to be developing those and sharing those with um, parents and guardians um, as soon as school opens up. Um, if you have any questions about any of the learning plans at any time, please reach out to me. Um, I, I don't, it, we don't know if you don't ask. So, and I have been saying this all, there are no dumb questions. Please ask us. And to be honest, every time someone asks, I think you probably feel this way too. Every time someone asks a question, I'm like, oh, I didn't think of that. Or, you know what, that's a really great question. It's just one more thing we need to think about. So, right. because, it, because here, unlike larger school districts, they have dozens of people working on a reopening plan. You know, there's, there's Mrs. Horak and me. And of course, we have a great reopening stakeholder team yeah. meeting. But uh, they're not on the ground with us every day to help think through these things. So, so you can help us by posing really great by posing any questions you have, um, which will just help us fill in all of the gaps and develop the best possible plans for all of us. Okay. So I just want to take a minute to talk about our special education students. So regardless of whatever model is being implemented, in person, virtual, or that hybrid um, model, we are going to provide the highest level of um, services that we can to support all of our students so that they can be successful in whatever um, environment they're in. We're going to continue to collaborate with you, uh, the parents and caregivers, to understand, you know, to make sure that each student is getting that free and appropriate public education that they so deserve. Um, we know that the spring was was tough for a lot of our students that fall into this population because of it's just virtual is not the best um, mode to to have these students engage in. So we're, we're really looking at each individual students um, IEP and we're if, if we determine that we need to make some changes, we will pull together that committee on special education and make those um, changes. Uh, we're going to be talking about 
in assessing what students, how they're doing in, in each, whatever method they're, they're using it and seeing if there's been regression or growth and what do we need to help support those students and make sure that they're successful here. Um, we're, I'm, I'm really looking at how each program is being implemented and I want to do everything I can to help ease your anxiety and stress about coming back to school. So again, if you are having concerns and your child falls into this population, please reach out to me now. Mrs. Barkley and I um, can have those conversations with you now and help relieve some of that stress and anxiety because I know um, as a mom who had a child um, with, you know, an IEP, I can't imagine that the stress of having to come back into this type of a setting. So um, please know that we're here to, to have those discussions. Our bilingual um, education, our English language learners are going to be supported just like they've always been supported here. They're going to um, receive instructional units of study based on the proficiency in the English language and we'll be working with those families on an individual basis because it's so um, it's so personalized and explicit and so that's really our teaching and learning plan. Um, if you have questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat box now or um, put them in the survey. And we're going to go over some of the questions that we've already come up in a few minutes. Yes. So uh, before we uh, uh, head over to the FAQ to uh, share with you some questions that um, that we've pre thought of. Um, so some other points that we want to make in, as part of our reopening. So we added this uh, interscholastic athletics. I know a lot of folks have asked me I'm the athletic director. What's going on with sports? Well, unfortunately, um, things have been postponed until September 21st, in which, in, in which time they will reevaluate to determine if we can actually run any programs um, this fall. If they determine that we cannot run programs, then we will uh, be pushing it off until, um, until January. And uh, if, if the pandemic improves and the New York State Public High School Athletic Association determines that sports can resume, then um, they have a plan to consolidate all three seasons <laughs> in half a year. We'll see how that goes. But I, but we're, we're I mean, they're, we're really clinging on to hope that we'll get some type of opportunity to participate um, in interscholastic sports. Um, the uh, extracurricular activities, um, some may be allowed if the uh, Department of Health and SED guidelines can be met. So Mrs. Horak and I will be meeting with our Sackets Harbor Club advisors, class advisors, to evaluate which activities extracurricular clubs can continue if they can give us assurances that they can maintain social distancing, mask wearing, cleaning and disinfection mandates. Um, then, then obviously we want to try to offer as much as we can this year. Uh, Import, of importance um, for those of you who have been used to using our, our building regularly, uh, it, that likely will not be the case this year. So we will be limiting the use of school facilities by outside groups. If outside groups can share, can provide assurances that they can meet those mandates um, and their numbers are small, then we certainly will consider that. But, you know, I'm thinking about those, those you know, the, those people we call the weekend warriors, the basketball players who come in and play on Saturday and Sunday mornings here in our school district, that probably, um, no, that's not probably, it's definitely going to be on hold until uh, until the pandemic improves. The um, school age child care, I want to talk about that for a moment because I've been working with the YMCA to try to uh, provide some some quality uh, child care program for our community on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. So as it stands right now, here's what it looks like. Um, if enough families register their children, uh, the SAC does plan to run a program on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Fridays from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, I've also been working with the Y to offer a full day child care slash learning center program here at Sackett's Harbor Central School District in our gymnasium from 630 in the morning and Wednesday until 6 p.m. at night. Um, so the uh, this is all contingent on um, whether or not enough students register and in the FAQ there's information about how you who you contact. And, and how you go about that. So just again, it all is contingent on if we have enough um, enough families signing up. And also it's important um, for folks to realize we are not going to be running a late bus this fall, unfortunately, um, at least to start off with. We have, um, we, we just don't believe we're gonna have, we don't have the activities after school to justify that. 
um, at this point in time. So now I want to share with you, I, I, I got it up on a separate tab, but uh, right on in the top tab, you'll see the frequently asked questions section. Um, can I stop you sure. before we get in there? So there's a couple of questions that I, I can answer right away that have been posed. Okay, go so will the class length be the same? So I, I, this is really directed at um, middle school and high school. So their class periods, um, we have had to eliminate one, uh, one period a day. However, um, it's going to, we are running, we're going to be running a seven period day, seven periods a day schedule. Those um, periods, all periods except fourth period, which I'll talk about in a second, are going to be 38 minutes, just like they've always been. Fourth period we're going to have is, gonna, is going to turn into our seventh. It used to be seven A, B, C. Well, now it's going to be four A, four B, four C, and four D. These are each 20 minutes, um, 20 minute blocks. And this isn't how, just how much um, lunch time, but it is to help us with lunch, but also to provide extra time for some of our science with labs and some of our AP and honors courses so that they can have extra time in their classes. It's just how the schedule kind of worked out mm -hmm. nicely and neatly. So um, lunches will still be 30 minutes, but they will be in classrooms for students in grades three through 12 with teacher supervision. Uh, we're still gonna be, you know, they'll still be taking care of all those food allergies and all of those things, but um, students will go through the line. We'll have uh, one entrance in the line, one exit out of the cafeteria um, to pick up lunches. And then um, they will be, um, students in grades K through two are actually gonna eat in the cafeteria because we know how difficult it is to manage trays and food. So they're gonna actually go and eat, but they will be socially distanced and um, disinfecting and cleaning procedures will be followed after that. And then the next one about will parents be picking up pre-K students at school still? Yes, but if you would like transportation in the morning, just like we've offered in the past, you are welcome to take an opportunity right. for that. Just make sure you complete the uh, survey. Um, that uh, indicate such for that AM run. Uh, uh, we have a question here about BOCES that is actually answered in our FAQ. Uh, the question is how will BOCES classes be handled this year? BOCES has worked very hard to try to accommodate all of their students on a daily basis. And at this point in time, I think BOCES is pretty close to finalizing it and um, it looks pretty good. It looks like our students will be able to attend uh, their BOCES programs on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, Ms. Torek and I are putting our heads together to talk about um, if, if it's even possible for us to get our BOCES students there on Wednesday. Um, so stay tuned, no guarantees, but we're gonna, we're gonna put our heads together and, and kind of work through that. Um, I'm going to do, there's a couple of questions here that aren't in the FAQ that Mrs. Horak and I will tackle and then we're going to go through and share with you the types of questions because I think a lot of the, some of the questions you may have right now are already um, within. The bus, uh, we have a parent asking if the bus driver will do the screening. The bus driver will not do the screening. Uh, however, uh, the bus driver will be the adult on the bus that will have to turn a student away if their temperature is 100 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. The, the mounted device, will, if mounted on the school bus, the bus driver will not have to hold a thermometer, will not have to actually do the screening him or herself. Um, it, the, the machine will actually beep if the temperature is above is 100 or above. And so that's why the, that's why uh, the driver, along with the parent, need to work collaboratively to make sure that that child who is sick is not boarding that bus. Um, there's another question here about if a parent would like their child to wear their mask even when seated six feet apart as much as possible. Are, the, are teachers comfortable encouraging that? Absolutely. I mean, it's every family is, is on a different end of that spectrum, and some are more cautious, some are, are less cautious. I mean, the, the minimum requirements are that the mask needs to be worn when you cannot maintain six feet distance. But if you work with your child to uh, to kind of up those expectations and the teacher is aware of that, then absolutely we will do our best to support that, uh, to support those expectations from your home. Um, so another question here. These are fantastic questions. So there, yes. Some of these are not the ones we have in our FAQ. Um, this one is, if my child does 100% virtual learning, will they still be able to participate in sports in the event that they are allowed to meet in September? And the answer is yes, absolutely. If your child is enrolled in school, um, enrolled in our district and sports resume, we would absolutely permit that. Um, we'd have to work out transportation issues that we haven't even, you'd have to figure out a way to get your child here for, um, for the, um, actually, let me go here. 
uh, for sports practice and such. Um, next, we check that and see if I don't know if it is charging. Yeah, I don't. I see. Okay. okay. Um, another parent asked if a student is isolated and set home for COVID symptoms. Are there siblings who could still be in school at the time allowed to stay? And this is a great question because it's something that um, I just was talking with Dr. John Fania um, in our school nurse about uh, yesterday, and we had that follow-up conversation with public health today. And the answer is yes. Uh, public or the Department of Health was very clear that districts should not exclude students who are not symptomatic, even if they are siblings. What we decided to do in our district was monitor closely. And if we start to see that we are experiencing COVID cases locally or right within our school district, uh, we would um, at that point uh, make a determination to be more restrictive. But at this point, as long as the rates are, are low, siblings would not be excluded. So I'm sharing with you now uh, the uh, family, and, uh, I'm sorry, back up the, the frequently asked questions um, which is set up in the uh, uh, aligned with the same format we used in our reopening plan. And we're not, I think I have 25 pages here, so <laughs> we are not going to go through the entire thing, but for each section, we'll ask, we'll share with you the question that we posed and you can um, at your leisure look at the answer when we go live. So question, how this will communicate? How or when will I get my child's teacher assignment for 2021? When will my secondary student get her schedule? Where can I find the supply list? Are there opportunities to meet with the teacher or administrators before the school year begins? When will school start? What if I have to drop my child off after the school day starts or pick him or her up before the school day ends? For instance, for a doctor's appointment. We have all of that information here. Will I be able to visit Sackett's Harbor Central School? How will my child know about all of the new expectations and how will they be prepared? All of those answers are here. Um, my child forgets something and I have to bring it in. I have to bring it in. What do I do? Um, I want to meet with an administrator or teacher during the school year. How would I go about setting this up? How will the district make decisions about in person or remote learning plans? And this and I, I want to just answer that for the for the for the whole group right now. Um, because we're going to monitor necessary absenteeism data. We're going to be monitoring local transmission data rates, and we're going to be working in partnership with Jefferson County Public Health to make those determinations about a change in learning plans. And I promise you folks, you will be the first to know about them after we make it. Our teachers, our faculty, our faculty, staff, and school community will know as quickly as possible after those decisions are made. This is a great question that just got asked, actually. Is the virtual program going to be an option for the entire year or will it be reevaluated each quarter? It's going to be an option as long as we are in this, as long as we are not back to that full in person, um, that there's no threat of this pandemic anymore. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it can be reevaluated each quarter. And what I guess what we mean by that is if you are a person that is doing the in person and something happens and you want to opt your child into the virtual, you could do that um, at the end of the quarter or your child's in the virtual program and you're like, yeah, this isn't really working. And you know what? Our, our situations change. We want them to try the in person. Then we'll do that at the quarter mark. So, um, you know, we can do those, but for, for many of our, you know, not many, but for some of our students, we know that they're going to be in that for the majority, if not the whole year. Okay. You want to take over? And just yep. So for questions? health and safety, you know, we're going to talk about, does my child have to wear a mask? Can I purchase a face shield instead of a mask? Um, face shields actually aren't allowed um, because they don't offer the same amount of protection. I just want to reach, you know, mm -hmm. point that out. What if I did do not have a mask for my child? No worries. We're getting those for you. Um, my child is going to have a hard time wearing a mask all day. No kidding. So are we. <laughs> so, um, you know, anytime that six foot distance cannot be maintained, they'll have to be masked. But if they are at their seats, um, they can take them off and have that mask break. Um, my child has a medical condition, which makes it impossible for to wear a mask. What is the protocol? That answer is here. How are you going to ensure the building is clean and disinfected to keep everyone safe? Those answers are here. Uh, my child is considered high risk and I'm concerned about sending him or her back. What are my options? You do have the options in person hybridized model or that remote learning model. Uh, my child nor anyone in my house has any underlying health conditions, but we're scared to send her to school. What are my options? Again, you do have options. It's um, that virtual model or the um, hybridized model. 
Um, I have an underlying medical condition. Again, that those same mm -hmm. things are there. What are the COVID symptoms? We're putting them there again. Um, my child's presenting with symptoms, but I'm not sure what should I do. Don't send them. <laughs> Consult with your doctor. Um, do they need to have their temperature taken every day? Yes, we all do. Um, how will students um, and staff take their temperature, take students' temperatures daily? We mm -hmm. have infrared thermometers. We've talked about the wall mounted wall mounted thermometers as well as the um, thermometers that are going to be mounted on the buses. Um, what if I take my child's temperature and they have a fever? Again, you're not going to send them to school. You're going to contact your physician. Mm -hmm. uh, what if someone in my family has COVID-19? You're going to talk to the Department of Health and they're going to help you out with that. Mm -hmm. um, what if my child becomes sick during the school day? Those are there. What if my student is in what if a student in my child's classroom is diagnosed with COVID-19? What's the school's protocol? Again, we do have um, that communication, that chart where you can see what's going to happen. And we also have those answers here. Uh, safety drills are going to be required. They're going to look a little different this mm -hmm. year, but they will be required. Um, and are we, um, we are not, it says if my child has a symptom, will the school test him? No, we're not actually testing. And the so. governor, the governor confused uh, New York state residents about that. Um, the school districts are, are not required to, nor is it even recommended that school districts are the, are the entity that tests. We are collaborating with the, with public health and other uh, outside medical providers to conduct the testing um, if, if need be on a larger scale, if we had an outbreak in our school. But uh, we are not testing asymptomatic um, uh, students or staff at this point. Um, so um, that kind of goes along with your question, Sophia, um, that um, if they're asymptomatic, we, we, I don't believe, will be requiring students to be tested in those classrooms. Correct. Correct. Now, I mean, we are, we are, um, we are, we'll be working with public health and based on their interviews, they will then determine who um, has come into uh, contact with that, um, with the infected person, and then they will be the ones that will direct um, quarantine accordingly. And um, while we will not be conducting, one of the questions is, will we conduct the contract? contact tracing. No, the Department of Health will be doing that. But it will be in collaboration with the school district. Mm -hmm. Facilities, we've made some changes um, and we've detailed them here. Uh, which doors will be used for entrance and exit? We're actually meeting tomorrow at nine o'clock with some of our team here to do to really work out the logistics for arrival and dismissal. And so we will, um, the next time we meet on the 20th, we will detail for the school community uh, which doors the, the, our buses are going to enter if they're elementary and secondary and how, what the, what the protocol is will be for dropping off their uh, students in the morning at eight o'clock or, or nine o'clock and which doors they would use. So just stay tuned for that. We're working out the details there. Um, how will classroom spaces be kept disinfected throughout the day? Uh, we've got a number of questions here about child nutrition, most of which I've already covered, but you can, if you have, mm -hmm. if you have a question, look here before you uh, shoot us a new question, please. I've had a couple questions come in on the, our Google Forms as well. Let me reiterate that you have two options. You have the option to, to opt into our hybridized program, which is in-person learning four days a week, virtual learning on Wednesdays. That's for all students, except for pre-K and kinder, well, pre-K. Pre-K is doing two days a week, three days virtual. You also, or if you don't like that, if you want them home and have them learn virtually five days a week, that is an option. So again, we have the hybridized option for you or the virtual option. Um, and then um, somebody is asking about the number of kids in a kindergarten classroom. How are we going to keep them safe all day and socially distanced? That seems like a lot of students. And I'm not sure where you're getting the number 33 from, um, but we we have a very small incoming kindergarten class um, and if if it got a lot larger we would simply just add another we'd have to figure out how to make another section to keep it um keep it so that they're socially distanced what i can say to you now is um about every classroom can at least accommodate um 12 to 14 students we have other classrooms that can accommodate um, up to upwards of 20 um, with six foot social distancing. So I've been in moving desks, counting, uh, <laughs> using Mr. Um, Keller and I have been measuring out. So please, please know that we are, are really looking at how we can maximize the space in our classrooms 
and, and have it be safe for all. So um, if numbers get too high, Ms. Gaffney and I will have those conversations and make some decisions. Great. All right, so there's a number of um, questions uh, for food service, uh, transportation. Um, uh, how many students can fit on a bus under the state's rules? Um, well, depending on how you how how you place students, we're actually looking at a zigzag pattern, and and we have determined that about 22 students on a school bus is a very safe number to shoot for. Um, I'm just going through these questions, so you see them up on your screen. Um, um, I do have another question. So it's about cohorting. So. Um, because all students are going to be here every day, they're not really being cohorted. They, they're being cohorted in the sense that students that follow similar schedules will be in similar places at the same time. But for example, if your child is in sixth, seventh, or eighth grade, those are um, heterogeneous groups, which means they're mixed abilities, boys and girls. Um, so just like we always do when we make our classes. So they're not, um, we're not just, you know, certain kids are in certain rooms. When you get up into the higher grades, especially the seniors and juniors, because they've made decisions, whether it's to go to BOCES or to take college classes, it does get a little bit narrower and those kids all seem to kind of congregate into one group. But um, we are not doing that. Um, we're, we're really looking at scheduling when you get up into the higher grades and really down um, in our middle school and early high school grades, it's really more about having a nice balanced mix so that everybody can learn from everybody. All right, another, another question, if a student goes home with symptoms, however, they have not had a test yet, will the other children in their classroom along with their teacher and other students that teacher has be taught, sent, uh, uh, taught be sent home or quarantined. Um, only if they are symptomatic would we uh, send any student or staff member home. And that's per the Department of Health um, guidance. Um, so I'm not going to read every question here. I just wanted to give you a lay of the land so that you can see the types of questions that we've uh, tried to, that we've tried to think of um, for you um, in advance and answer for you, uh, technology on teaching and learning, and special education and lots of other things. Um, um, that's a good question. Um, it's about is one teacher responsible for teaching the hybrid and 100% virtual? Just curious how effective they will be if they are spread too thin. No, we're really um, looking at a team approach here, like we do with everything. And I'm not, I, I can't give you a complete answer of what that's going to look like just because we're still scheduling. But um, we've been um, talking with um, the Sackets Harbor Teachers Association and having good conversation with them. Um, and talking about how we can do this effectively so, right. so that students' needs are met. And it's, and it's she, uh, whoever posed that question brings up a very good point uh, about our teachers getting spread too thin. Uh, we recognize that you know, offering the option um, of the in-person and virtual is, is going to be a significant burden on our teaching staff. We want them to be able to do everything they do with fidelity and, and with the highest levels of effectiveness for our students. Um, that's why we, we believe, along with our, our association here, that our teachers need the time to do that. And that is why we, um, you know, we're using the, those staggered times. Uh, you know, our secondary folks will have some time in the mornings, our, our elementary teachers will have time in the afternoons, and those Wednesdays are going to be absolutely crucial to providing our teachers with the time and the support that they need in order to do both virtual and in person as well as they possibly can. So with that, um, I, I don't see any other questions rolling in, so I'm going to end the, the Q&A session. I'll close out with a couple of remarks. And, um, and you know, I appreciate you folks taking so, so uh, much time to be with us tonight. So uh, before we uh, close, I want to inform you about a survey. I've already done that. It's mandatory for each uh, family to complete. The survey will ask about your cho chosen learning plan in person or virtual. It will ask about your transportation choice. Do you need transportation or can you transport your child? It will ask about your child care needs. It will ask about underlying medical conditions and whether or not you need a face covering. It, this should take five minutes or less. Please complete it as soon as possible. It is due by August 17th. If we do not receive a response back from you that our staff, our staff member will be reaching out personally. Our next community town hall forum will be Thursday, August 20th at 6 p.m. I already shared with you what that would consist of. 
And to end tonight, um, we would like to thank you for your continued patience and flexibility. Um, I can say out of my, in my career here, this has been the most challenging um, time in, in, in my career. And uh, I would say, I would, I guess to say the, the educational institution as a whole. So um, we're really thankful to work alongside all of you and, um, you know, to make sure that learning remains a priority for the children. So we hope to connect with you on the 20th and the, la the last few questions that we have that are filtering in, we'll put in the FAQ in just a few moments. You'll get those answers um, shortly. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great evening. Do, are we sending out the link? We are sending out the link just, just yep. in just a few moments. Yep. So you'll be getting that. All right. Yep. Have a great night, everybody. Bye, everybody. Take care. We'll see you soon. All right. Can we do that right now? Let's do that.